and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Soli. Welcoming back is martial artist Braden D. White. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very solid. And here we are to talk about some of our favorite action sci-fi horror franchises. And in this case, it is Undisputed. What are the best moments, the best fights, the best, just the awesome sauce, so to speak, that this franchise has? Uh, I take it you saw them in order, or did you see part two and then see the rest? Um, actually, I. <laughs> so the story goes, legend has it that 2009 Scott Atkins came out with his movie Ninja. That turned me into a huge fan of Scott Atkins, and then through that movie, the next one that he did after that was Undisputed Three. And then that's when I found out about Undisputed 2. And yeah, which ve- just just to kind of recap here, I do remember being like 12, 11 to 12 years old and being in like, like a big lots or something. And you know how like in those lower end stores, I always got that one shelf that has like DVDs for like three to five dollars on it. Right. Can't yeah. go wrong. Yeah. And I saw it. And my mom told me I could pick out a movie if I saw one that I liked. And I saw Michael Jai White with his hands up like this on the cover. Right. And so I was like, uh oh. The black dynamite guy. Oh yeah. Where'd he start? <laughs> well, this was this was this was oh, like before. So that's before just Black Spawn Dynamite. And Unisol too. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't even know who he was from that. I just knew I saw hand wraps and his hands up getting ready to fight. All right. And so I was like, okay, this looks kinda maybe sorta kinda. And uh I read the back of it, and what turned me off was boxing and wrestling. Because at that point I just got out of wwe because i wasn't really you know it didn't do anything for me anymore and i never really was the hugest fan of boxing but and so when i read boxing and wrestling i was like eh i'm the same way i would just casually see wrestling and boxing unless it was a movie like rocky and just i just like who fucking cares it's a mob boss sport where people get punched to death it's yeah so i mean i was kind of i was just kind of ass so i put it back and i pick something else out i don't even know what it was but i picked something else out (laughs) and uh and that was that and then it was after i found out who scott adkins was and then uh actually i think i may have my story wrong i found 2009's ninja and then after researching him is when i found out about this and i remember seeing the trailer for undisputed 2 way back when and i was like oh damn you mean this was the dude that was in that movie and <laughs> and then that's when i found out oh cool. okay cool they're making undisputed three so i watched that and uh and then you know uh undisputed four came out relatively recently so i mean i remember i watched undisputed three on dvd I bought the DVD. Well, let me let me say this. I watched Undisputed 3 when it was out on Netflix. This was back when Netflix really started to become prominent with the streaming, like 2010, 2011. Same. Yeah, they started so, out every other low-budget TV, B-movie on there. Yeah. Back when it was actually a viable thing for independent filmmakers. Yeah. And uh, so I watched it then. And then when I started working when I was 18, 19 years old, um, I bought the DVD. And then I watched that DVD like maybe 300 or so times. (laughs) It's very specific. (laughs) I I watched it a bunch because, you know, at this point I'd already made up my mind this is what I wanted to do with my life. So I watched it and I watched it the first time I watched it on the DVD, it had been like three years since I had seen it last. So I watched it strictly from an audience point of view as a moviegoer. Before saying, then, hey, I want to make a movie like this. And then <laughs> Yeah, and then then it then it turned into homework. Like, all right, like let's let's study 
the the choreography let's study the movement the camera movement the the dialogue let's figure out what makes this movie a movie and and then you know undisputed 4 came out and that's pretty much how i watch any movie anymore the first time i watch it strictly from an audience point of view and then i go into the okay let's study the choreography let's study the dialogue let's study how they move the camera let's study the camera movement and the 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 fps and the shutter and all that kind of stuff nice yeah, yeah. Uh, I was the same way. I, I was I, so long story short, I was all into all kinds of you know we've talked about before B action uh, movies, just showing they could be just as big budget as low budget without being you know garbage. So I saw anything, whether it was a you know mainstream planet Hollywood movie like Stallone, Bruce, Arnold to uh, Van Damme's uh, was the Snipes, and then all the other you know direct to video guys like Frank Zagarino. Uh, Don the Dragon Wilson. It didn't matter if the tone was way too much or silly or something like Full Moon Entertainment. I was like, hey, they're fun. They're Friday, Sunday night movies. They're, there's a reason they're on USA or TNT or Spike TV all the time. They're just fun. Guilty pleasure. Or sci-fi. Yes, sci-fi would have Olivia Grunner. Sci- or sci-fi was the uh, sci- the sci-fi channel was like the king of like the the low budget. Creature features, creature features, <laughs> kickboxing, <laughs> cyborgs, and, <Yes. laughs> and some of them were so bad they were good, and some of them were just like fun. And then there was others like, well, you just have to see it to believe it. <laughs> see, I have I have an analogy for that though, because like people's like, oh, that movie's so cheesy. Why do you like it? That's my kind of re- my retort is: Have you ever seen a three year old who does not like cheese pizza? Bingo. <laughs> the thing that they like about that pizza is the cheese. Unless, even if they're we, lactose intolerant, they love exactly. <laughs> they love we watch cheese. these. That's the reason we watch these movies. Is because they are so cheesy. We enjoy it. We uh, we see it at face value. We are not taking that away. But that is what's giving us the enjoyment. And I liked how you mentioned the frame rate and the visual look because people will also be snobby about that is like well this is literally no different than your worst godzilla movie mm-hmm. it really isn't you budget does not change anything it might nope. in terms of how it visually looks but it's the same damn thing it really mm-hmm. is so yeah i was into all kinds of things the uh, sniper substitute best of the best and mm-hmm. so event so long story short i i remember seeing hot take uh the first two undisputed Mm-hmm. Kind of came back a little disappointed, but I kept rediscovering them. I kept giving them a chance and saying, you know, I get it. I, I get why people like this. Uh, the, the first one, again, it's a uh, two framed, uh, you know, not the most ethical boxing guys. And it's Walter Hill of 48 Hours and Johnny Handsome and all those other just hard boiled 80s westerns and cop dramas. You know, I will say my biggest complaint with the first one was they had Wesley Snipes in it and Wesley Snipes is one of the most talented martial artists that came out of his time. Yes, and he doesn't get to do martial arts. He doesn't get to. <laughs> like I don't think that movie would have been any different if they would have just changed it from boxing to kickboxing. Right. I really don't. It's already an implausible scenario. Mob bosses own this Oz type prison, and yeah, we got you betting. a championship boxer who is going to fight our prison champion. Okay, I mean, what's what's? I mean, you basically take that same scenario. Basically, one and two are essentially the same movie, just change the setting and change the actors. Correct, and. Uh yeah, one's in like uh Georgia or LA mm-hmm. prison. I can't remember which one. It's it's second, one of those. And second, second one takes one. place in Chermel Tromy, Russia. Right. In the thick of Russia. And basically there are no rules. <laughs> it's a mm-hmm. free for all. But see, you could have changed Yuri Boyka into the Wesley Snipes character of the first one, and you essentially have the same plot. So why couldn't you let Wesley Snipes do the 
karate and stuff that he's known for, and you had to make it a straight prison boxing movie. It actually would have even been more interesting, you know. You got I agree Rames as this Mike Tyson type boxer, and Snipes could be the martial artist, and so therefore it would show even more how the intensity of how they have to fight to the death. And exactly, none of them have the same skills, let alone physical ability. <laughs> exactly either way i like it it's just not it, it's just not the i enjoy the first thing. one at face value it's fun. but it's just... as a martial arts fan and a martial artist i enjoy the other three a whole lot more no that's fine and uh, part one's main issue i think i was just the shitty poster that you see this giant what looks like a cool hand loop type prison escape and there's an explosion yeah. helicopter and you're like don't no don't put an explosion if that's not going to happen in the actual yeah movie. like the the, ex, the exploding helicopter on the poster i remember thinking that like i remember watching the movie and then i saw the poster later on and i was like was there like a director's cut or something that i did not see yeah i don't remember <laughs> exploding helicopter and there were so many similar movies around that same time half past dead and yeah going into just... this you're gonna probably have someone who gets disappointed thinking it's something like escape plan i'm like no not that kind of movie either it's just yeah, a it's, running man it's... fight to the death kind of movie that's all it is. yeah which i mean it's totally fine but like i understand the posters was gonna sell your movie but at the same time people see that explosion they're gonna get a certain idea and then when that movie does not deliver but then again, this is also the days before like streaming and stuff. So in order to find out there was no explosion in it, you either had to buy it, rent it, or go to the theater to watch it. It was word of mouth. So by the we time couldn't. you were already disappointed, the executives didn't give a shit because they you've already paid them your dollar bill. Yeah, you had already <laughs> taken the bait and you were too distracted with, wow, that was really good. Wow, that was decent. Oh my god, that sucks. You know, as or, then, or you were just you're one of the one of five people who went into the theater thinking, all right, when's this explosion about to happen? <laughs> but it's still it doesn't matter. You've done page uh, we'll see, that came out in like what, ninety two thousand two. Two thousand two, yeah. So and it was overshadowed at that point, because yeah, Bing uh, Rames and by was that doing... point you've already you've already went into the theater, you've paid at that point, I'm assuming was like three dollars and eighteen cents. So there's no and, use for you to complain anymore. The studios done got your money. Well, and we were already distracted by other stuff. Bing Rains was doing Mission Impossible and was better known for Con Air and Pulp Fiction and Wesley yeah. Snipes. Let's be honest, Blade Two was Blade, the movie yeah. one. Saw. Yeah, Blade Two. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how, how do you rank the the final fight? Uh, I I actually like how they don't do too many tracking. They just kind of show the audience's point of view and give equal screen time and you they may let you make up who you're rooting for um i will say that that's one of the aspects that i liked but at the same time the way they shot it you know i wish that they would have shot it a little bit more in, in the, the ring. ring okay yeah, yeah that from from somebody's point make it a little bit more personable because the way they shot it made it sound you know, if I wanted to watch a boxing match, I'll turn on ESPN. Right. I, I want to, I want to, like, like, like the Creed movies. I like how they did those fight scenes because you're in the ring with them and it makes me feel for the character a little bit more. Yeah. And there's so you can the kind of feel shots. the struggle. Yeah. But, and so, like, uh, I don't really, that's why, like, I, I appreciate the Rocky movies, but I, I just think the fights were not shot well because they're ringside. And it makes me feel like I'm watching a boxing match. If I want to watch a boxing match, I'll get one off pay-per-view or I'll turn on ESPN. No, it's fine. I It's kind of all about just kind of the fitness and drama more than it is the fights, which is a shame because you yeah, kind of yeah. don't see the fights. Um, yeah. I kind of felt like I knew enough about them and had already kind of made up my mind how they're just imperfect and... You know, one of them kind of feels like this is a chance at redemption, while the other is kind of like, well, this is my chance to avoid locker room talk. I can't be a wimpified. I got to win this match. Um, yeah. And they basically have all kind of both been screwed over. Snipes basically has a crappy lawyer who won't, you know, uh, figure out a deal. And basically, Rames is realizing, wow, I'm being used by everybody. The media, my, uh, my guys, and 
other press. So basically, I got to win this in order in order to just have a career after I get out of this hellhole. Yeah. But, uh, I, I I like how just we see the crowd, but they're not interfering. I, I hate it when I see a fight scene and that people are just constantly like just shouting in the middle of it. I'm like, no, 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 you're interrupting the flow of the fight. <laughs> yeah, it's like you'll see like three punches, then you'll cut to some random guy just cheering excessively <laughs> and i'm like what was the point of that shot come on kick his ass I, that's exactly what get him doing. a body bag yeah <laughs> karate kid yeah <laughs> it's like that in every other franchise would drive me crazy because it's like they yeah. would be ripping off blood sport or karate kid mm-hmm. it's just like okay the best part of those was we were in the ring not seeing random love interest or news reporter further their career by you know encouraging <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah, onto the the second one. Obviously, there are so many fights in this. I mean, when we first see Boyka, you know, uh, we we th- wait, we're unsure if he's we, we aren't prepared. You know, at first we think he's just going to be the heavy, you know, the Al Leong, Matthias, who's at the movie, and then as it goes on, it's like no, he's this is a tertiary kind of character study. We're going to be uh, observing him and how he's forced to fight by the crooked warden, Russian warden. As well as, you know, Jay White, who's playing. I, I wish, what I would like, if if we do get an Undisputed 5, because we understand that Boyka is the, most un, is, the, is the most complete fighter in the world. And he has all these different tattoos that signify his heritage. He's got the, the Russian Mafia stars on his shoulder. He's got mm-hmm. the Okinawan karate right here on his chest. He's got several others. I want to know more about Boyka as a character. Yeah. Like, why Why did he start training martial arts? Why did he start doing all this? But at the same time, you know, I want to understand his motives. Like, because when we meet him, he's already like a champion and he's done all this and this, that, and a third. I want to know what got him to that point. I'd be down as long as it wasn't someone else like playing the role, but like have someone who's like, maybe he just reunites with the guy who trained him years ago and he's been kidnapped and he must find a way to eliminate him and even change up the mob mobsters. They could just be Italian, South Korean or some shit. Something. But you know, if it's a, if it's an undisputed movie and this guy Boyka, then it's going to end up with some ring fights. No, totally. He he needs to be captured again and forced to fight, and the guy's like, again, I want to see what you can do, and then, of course, at the end, he does the inevitable roundhouse kick, breaks the fighter's neck, and yeah. then kills the rest of the mobsters, <laughs> disarming yeah. them slowly. Wait, wait for them to run out of bullets, and then, you know, kicks the shit out of them. <laughs> and the main reason I say that is because when we meet Boyka in Undisputed 2, he's already a cocky son of a bitch. Yeah. And we're like, okay, like the audience is kind of taken back by that. We're not and sure. We're, like we're, him or we're, not. <laughs> yeah, we're and we're we're kind of left to think one of two things. One, either this dude is crazy mm-hmm. or he's just as good as he says he is. Or third option is a little bit of both. Yeah. And I think it goes more with that third option. Yes, he's a little bit sadistic, but when you see him in the ring, he's tearing the shit out of people right and as it gets more challenging he starts being unsure so then there's that humanity reinforced as opposed to mm-hmm. you know mindless and i uh, will say as short as it is my probably my favorite fight in undisputed 2 is when he fights i don't think he had a character name but the guy that when he fights uh silvio c do you know who silvio c is Correct. Yes. Big, big six foot two muscle bound dude. He's been in a bunch of movies, I think. Yeah, he, he's been a, he's he's been a supporting character in tons of movies. He fought the Jason credits. Statham in Undisputed in uh, Transporter Three. Uh, he was in. Oh Alive. yeah, that guy. yeah. So yeah, he, yeah. The, the credits claim it's Davik. So keep, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, big muscle bound dude. He's like a like a third, fourth degree black belt Taekwondo. Amazing kicks. Um, yeah. But that's probably my favorite is because, you know, you got two people, at least in real life, like you take the actor Silvio C. Mac and Scott Atkins, 
they have a very similar martial arts background. Both study Taekwondo for years. Both are both, you know, they're both into the muscle bound fitness type of regime. Right. So it was, it was very, very interesting to see that. And then I'm not going to lie. Whenever I first started thinking about doing movies, like on a serious note, there's a couple bits of choreography that I wanted to steal from that fight. <laughs> like there's a, uh, where he, he kicks him and he catches the leg and he does the 540 kick over his leg and then he goes into a front kick and then he back kicks him in the face. I Very wanted nice. to steal that and uh, there was a couple other ones that I don't, I can't really think of right offhand. But yeah, that was the main one. It's like where he catches the foot and he does, he jumps and tries to kick him with the other leg and then he throws him into a front flip and then he back kicks him in the face i was like that was sexy i want that (laughs) yeah the the first time i saw that piece of choreography i was actually in the computer lab at high school and i made a little bit more noise than i was supposed to (laughs) i'm sitting there watching i'm like oh shit (laughs) do you see this (laughs) yeah uh, awesome yeah no it's it's a good fight i i think their final fight is also good because at that point you know they've gotten rid of the inter- outside interference so to speak and now it's their final yeah what i liked about it was uh what i liked about the final fight was especially leading up to it you know you have that that small like little training montage training for the good. final fight yeah um what I, what I really liked about it, and, you know, I'm thinking about this from a, you know, a martial artist standpoint, when it cuts to Boyka training, he's just doing the same training that he's done over and over and over again. Right. But when you cut to Michael Jaya White's training, it's constantly cutting to flashbacks of his first fight with Boyka. Totally. And so he's he's learning... And I really love how he's trying to make himself seem bad at throwing kicks. Yeah, they because he's playing play a boxer. Mm-hmm. But we all know that Michael Jai White is like nine different kinds of badass. Totally. And so, so the fact that he and what I really appreciate was Michael Jai White actually made an effort to make it look like he was bad at throwing kicks. But I also heard from the behind the scenes that uh where he's playing a boxer he got so frustrated that he couldn't throw kicks so when the camera wasn't rolling he would just go over to the heavy bag and just start going to town on it with some kicks just to get it out of the system yeah that that makes sense get it out show people what you can do there might be a casting director on site you know just looking for that well no it wasn't even that it was just he he just you know he just got so frustrated that he couldn't throw kicks that he would just when they when they would say cut all right, you got 20 minutes for the next setup. He would go over to the punching bag and just start kicking on it just to get it out of his system for his own sake. No, that's good. That makes sense too. Um, And he, he really owns the role after a while because, you know, you have to adjust a person like, wait, Iceman, isn't that freaking Ving Rhames from the first one? <laughs> and you're just like, and can we oh. also talk about the fact that Ving Rhames also, with the, with the casting of... Iceman going from Ving Rhames to Michael J. White. Then in the process, he also de-aged himself like 20 years. Yeah, they did a Marvel Cinematic Universe on that. How does Don yeah. Cheadle like, suddenly not look like Terrence Howard? <laughs> yeah, it's it's very it's very very much one of those things where he's like it's like, I, I understand it's supposed to be the same characters and where the first one had a theatrical release and the second one didn't, you can kind of get away with it. Well, it is a at the same thing, time, but yeah, you're, if you're wondering. But at the yeah. same time, it's like it's it's like I mean, I guess it's because I'm a hardcore fan that I'm I'm one of the ones that's like okay, you know, Ving Rains when he shot this was like in his fifties, and now you got my boy Jai White who's in his thirties. It definitely almost it makes one wish they could have just been separate characters. I I, I do. Yeah, I, I I almost feel like they could have been. I I also want Snipes to come back in some way. Like he fights. I, I just want I want I want Snipes to come back, not just to to Undisputed, 
but I would like to see him. Yeah, fight. Boyka. Uh, well, not only just fight Boyka, I would like to see him come back and do an action movie in general. Yeah, he's been doing a lot of bit parts and other stuff, and you're like, well, I know he's so much more talented than that. Uh, is something going on that I don't know about? You know. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like Harrison Ford, where you're like, okay, I want to see more of what we know you for doing versus just kind of show up for an amusing cameo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because Wesley Snipes, I mean, I still feel like, you know, I feel like he was underused in Expendables 3. Oh, really? And the That's only kind of like other him. movies that he's done, <laughs> really, he did that armed response and some other alien yeah, the recall, but again, yeah, those are, those are aliens, doom type stuff. Not yeah, and you know, I'm like, let's let's get a true Art of War three happening instead of that one <laughs> with that other dude. <laughs> Treach, yeah, that was amusingly stupid. <laughs> oh god, it was a mess. I appreciate what you tried to do with it, but thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh. When, when watching that uh, trashy sequel, I kept looking directed by Roger Corman or Jim Wynorski because it had that feel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But I digress. Anyway, um, uh, it's also kind of a shame because you realize, you know, Bing Rames also has a black belt, and yet he doesn't really utilize it all that on screen all that much. It makes you wonder if it was just for self-defense or for fun. <laughs> I mean, everyone has their own reasons for doing martial art. Like, I have, there's people that I've seen in karate classes that I've either been a part of or taught that, you know, they have as much passion for it as I do. But, and, you know, whenever I see that, I'm like, ooh, maybe they would like to do a movie. So I'd ask them, and they'd be like, eh, nah, that's not really my <laughs> thing. Like, they can absolutely love martial arts, but not want to do it on a movie. Right. Like, I actually had to cancel a film for that same reason because you know i asked i asked this this girl that was in my karate class and i was like hey you want to do this movie she's like yeah it sounds like fun but the more she thought about it the more she was like yeah it's not really my thing well so, if you feel like somehow i mean i noticed this with other people like uh don the dragon wilson and jeff speakman were both recently interviewed by uh two dollar late fee good show mm -hmm. by the way and they noted how it's like they would turn down roles just for the fact that they if they just had a sense that the filmmaker was going to be a total tool and not respect them or in a way like overcut everything and in a way like disrespect their master's teachings, they would turn yeah. it down in a heartbeat. It's like, no, that that's no different than me, you know, kicking your dog. You know, that's that's not cool. That will not fly. <laughs> yeah. And I, I worked with some other martial artists, and I had to respect him. I was like, no, nah, yeah, this director doesn't really know what he wants, so I can't blame you for turning this down if they're going to make you look just crappy or the it's going to look fake as hell. And then it's yeah. a disrespect to your art, because you're working on this. You are the real deal, so therefore, they didn't mean anything by it, but they really did kind of still offend you unintentionally because they didn't respect your physicality on screen. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's out of your control. Like, uh, I, 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 one of my friends is John Ken. He worked on Out for Justice and everything, and Unisol 2. And he said there's like way more fights with Kurt Russell in the prison fight in Tango and Cash. Yeah. But, but because it was Stallone running the show, he cut that down because of his ego. Mm. So it unfortunately still happens. Uh, just there's too many voices in the room. I mean, and that's one thing, even like The Rock nowadays. Oh, uh, yeah. He, he, I mean, I appreciate his movies and his physicality, but he actually has it in contract that he cannot lose a fight on screen. Yeah. And I think that's stupid. And then there's other A-listers who I don't really... I consider them okay actors, but not really badasses. And, like, Jamie Foxx will do that. That's why the ending of Law Abiding Citizen feels out of place. And, like, yeah, no, yeah. there's no fucking way <laughs> he's winning this fight against the psycho. He just doesn't have that charisma or just backstory that he's able to reinforce that someone like frank grillo or atkins or even statham would have probably yeah put in their movie even the rock could have done a fine job with it back in that day but yeah unfortunately everyone's kind of doing financial security instead of hey you know i can actually do something that i want to do <laughs> but i mean and that's part of the reason why i appreciate the undisputed movies the way i do is because no outside interference 
Well, not only that, I mean, um, especially from two and two to four, you know, the director is a martial artist himself. Yeah. He so was. he understands, you know, he, he gets both point of view. You know, you want to show your stuff, but at the same time, we got a movie to make. So let's combine them. Let's see how we can merge our two worlds and get the best possible outcome. And that's why I think Isaac Florentine is one of the best directors when it comes to martial arts action that we have. And I wish that he would get bigger budgets or get hired to do some bigger budgeted films because he has that eye of like, okay, this is what's going to work. Totally. I, I think after doing Power Rangers and realizing he wasn't doing camp anymore, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I like parts of uh, Bridge of Dragons, but there's some other just kind of overlong edits that I don't really feel fit his current visually stunning deal. And yeah. I feel like mm -hmm. with Undisputed 2, he was like saying, hey, I'm making Savate with Olivia Grunner, but even bigger. Yeah. I'm... I got I got uh Steve Edwards who scored all those Jackie Chan's Hong Kong movies. So I got a great score. I got a cool set design. I got the Millennium Films guys who, you know, later on went on to do Expendables and Olympus has fallen saga. Um Yeah. But yeah, no, all these fights are pretty dynamite. I don't have any issue with the camera work other than the over edited train station reunion. I Yeah, that's that <laughs> I get it kind of takes away from the rest of them. Like you're going through this whole movie and then you get to the train station reunion and you're like, it, it, it just kind of takes you out of it. So they shoot it in like a few takes and I don't know if it's the music over blaring for a few seconds, but yeah, honestly, it's, it's, I just think, I just think it's out of place. The whole scene in general. Yeah. We, we kind of got that. We weren't really following that character. It could have literally just been one brief hug in the background while the main character talks and narrates, you know, <laughs> I mean, I understand why they put it in there, but at the same time, like, you're not the focal point of the story, so why do we have to end the movie this way? Yeah. <sighs> Mild annoyance, but... So, part three. Uh, part introduces three. Introduces us to... Uh, Marco Zoror. Uh, yeah, Marco Zoror, who I feel is a very talented dude who hasn't really been utilized enough, really. And then there's Michael Shannon Williams as Turbo. He's you look at his resume and he's another one. I'm like, uh, okay, so other than behind enemy lines too, he's guest starred on all the CSIs and soap operas that he should actually be in an action movie, I think. <laughs> oh no, like he I remember seeing I forget which soap opera, they're all basically the same to me. They Correct. all kind of run together. I think so. I forget which yeah, I, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Like I said, they That's all have the resume. same look, the <laughs> yeah. same feel, they all run together for me. So uh <laughs> So I remember seeing him on on one of them. Like I said, I don't remember which one. Didn't really care. <laughs> it doesn't. But uh, it's so I was a little bit eh. And then like I saw his first fight scene in the movie. I was like, oh, okay, he showed up to play. Okay, I see you. And then of <laughs> course he has that uh. I'm not really going to call it a bromance because it's not really a bromance, but... It's a lethal weapon movie. I mean, because, like, he forms... I would say, at the very least, they form somewhat of a friendship. It's They're not just all an understanding. the way there. It's There's more kind like of a mutual, hours. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual understanding of, like, I don't like you, you don't like me, but we kind of have to work together if we're going to get through this. So more like Defiant Ones. Like, yeah, minus the chain chain together. Like they rip that chain out after the first fight, and I really love that fight how it illustrates because it's what both. I think is funny though. Yeah, is uh, you knit like after they have the fight where they're chained together. If anything, this is coming from me work used to work in the correctional system. I would add more chain, but instead, throughout the rest of the movie, you see less chain. Yeah. After that whole chain fight. And I'm like, no, no. At the very least, separate the two. <laughs> I mean, I think they were just, it's like a video game. They're just going through waves of big bosses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but still, but I, I, mean, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like, especially when they're fighting each other attached to the chain, like, separate the two after that. But no, you just keep putting them right next to each other. 
Yeah, they well, get to anyway. They get to utilize Latif Crowder from the Protector with Tony Jaw. And... Yeah, I will. I will say that's one of my biggest gripes, but I understand why they did it. Was they kind of stereotyped the fights a little bit? Yeah, Latif Crowder got you know he's a Brazilian guy. You got him doing capoeira. You got uh, Ilram Choi, Korean dude doing taekwondo i don't know if it's florentine giving them free reign or what but it is what it i was. mean i understand honestly i don't think it was intentional because you know ilan Choi is korean that's why he studies taekwondo mm-hmm. and latif crowder is brazilian that contributes a big reason as to why he studies capoeira so i don't think it was necessarily intentional but you know, they I feel like they could have hit it a little bit better. Totally. But I mean all the fights in that one are, are pretty, pretty solid. Um I would say my two highlights are of course the final one that clocks in at like seven and a half minutes. And then you have before that you have Scott Adkins versus Latif Crowder, which is probably the epitome of athleticism that I've ever seen when it comes to fight scenes because they're both jumping and flipping and twisting and kicking and it's just it's a wonderful display of athleticism and makes me kind of jealous that I can't do half the shit they did in that fight (laughs) but I digress they are are movie gods Um, uh, there's some cool gunplay near the end doesn't feel like a cop out for me. I do like how it's a mixture of high kicks and then disarming and then using people's as body shells and then machine gunning the rest of the prison guards. That's yeah. Cool. And by that point, we're ready for that. It's like, are they going to actually escape or is it going to be inevitable? Just you know, get locked up in the hole and then move to another prison for next. And what I liked at the very well, what I liked at the very end was you know they touched on it a little bit. It was never really confirmed in the movie. But Turbo's character is actually supposed to be former former military. Yeah, I think he has like a marine tattoo, but you know, they don't. Yeah, he has a, he has a marine tattoo, and also he has that uh, improvise, adapt, overcome. It's almost like when you see both Pacino and De Niro in Heat, and when you and you realize, wow, they're literally the same person. But it took me multiple viewings to actually notice that. I kind of wish they could have hinted at that a little more. That would have been more badass. I mean, well, I mean not only that, but like I, I really appreciated the fact that you know they kind of they kind of hinted more at the military thing at the very, very end, where he comes back to you know when he when he comes back to when Boyka's about to get eliminated. And yeah, then and he here comes the Turbo. He, you know, yeah, he, he does that. And plus, he also steals the gun and he shoots a couple of them. And, you know, for military, he's going to know exactly where to shoot. And he killed all the guards that he shot with one shot. This was very instrumental. Yeah. And he's yes. aiming for the head. He's not, you know, looking to wound anyone. He's yeah, like, there's and, no rules. And the way he's holding the gun is is correct and everything. So, I've, like I said, that's one. That's one thing that if someone has a background, you know, those are the kind of things that I like is whenever there's instances where it's shown, okay, this is why they have that kind of background because he has, because he has military. It's like with, that's part of the reason why I want to see more of Boyka's background is because one of my biggest pet peeves with these action movies, especially where there's a lot of martial arts action is the main character is just some super hyper commando ninja and there's no explanation as is why he has this skill set yeah it's an outdated like batman or kung fu kind of thing he's badass just because i'm like well yeah i really i want to see how he got to this like what training he did what was i don't even necessarily need to see the training what i just want some sort of explanation of to as to why like like even a simple uh, line of dialogue i've been waiting for this you know i mean not even that it's just i i I would like some sort of explanation in the story as to why like with scott atkins and legacy of lies and seized he's 
ex special forces, MI six, whatever, that would explain why he has the skill set that he has. Something as simple as that. Like the one that I hate the most is fucking uh two of Jean Claude Van Damme's films. Uh Desert Heat and uh God. Nowhere to Run. <laughs> yeah. You know, he he has all these great martial arts fight scenes and these nice kicks, but it's like, okay, where did that come from? Yeah, that it, even with uh, Maximum Risk, they kind of imply that he's been a spy or something for a while, but uh, the rest of them feel very out of place, and you're just like, what is this trying to do? Oh, well. Exactly, and I, and I appreciate uh, Satellite TV trying to, to remedy this, because in Nowhere to Run, it would show up on my movie channels on direct TV, and it would <laughs> say a martial artist escaped con. And I'm just like, okay, but in the story, it's, he's never referred to as a martial artist. Correct. He's just an escaped con who knows how to fight. Well, and it just defends us as viewers. It's like, are we missing out on something? I, I've been watching this for a whole hour, and I feel like something's been left out. <laughs> exactly. So that's why, you know, with with my films, I try to put something in the story that would show why my character would have that kind of background. Like with my short skin circuit, I had that training scene at the very beginning. That was my way of showing this character knows karate without him having to look dead face in the camera and be like, I know karate. <laughs> yeah. I didn't I didn't want to pull a Keanu Reeves from the Matrix. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> So with me adding that little training scene, that was me establishing that that character has a martial arts background. And then at the end, of course, I added the line of dialogue where the, the detective is like, oh, you know, you're such and such black belt in karate and all that. That was an, that was another way that was. But I did it in a way to where it's like the detective is like, I know your tricks, so don't try nothing. Right. But also... You know, at the beginning, I wanted with that training scene, that was the main reason for the training scene mm -hmm. was to establish that this character does have a martial arts background without flat out just stating it. Right. Not blunt in your face. And you're like, whoa, whoa, I wasn't even and prepared it's, for that. <laughs> it's it's kind of the, the that's why I appreciate what they did with the turbo character in number three was because they put all these things in there that subtly nod to the fact that this character has a military background, but they never straight out say that he was in the military. Yeah. You hey, know, you yeah. have Blake ask about it, you were military, and then he has the improvise, adapt, overcome. And, you know, then I think the biggest one is he knows how to use a gun, like, properly. Totally. Uh, so often they'll just kind of let stuff slide and it's like, okay, got a pretty big trigger finger there. <laughs> Someone's probably yeah, going to get I mean, because it'd be one thing if he just came out with the gun and he like did the stereotypical gangbanger thing like, yeah, son, and like the whole holding the, holding it sideways and all that, but no, he's straight out and he, boom, boom, boom. He knows what he's doing. Totally. And this is probably one of the better roles for Esteban Quito. If you know that name, he's a former U.S. Army Ranger who's done a lot of martial arts and stunts in movies. You probably know him from Fast Five, Triple X, Scorpion King, and various other Michael J. White, Atkins, Dolph Lundgren, and Schwarzenegger movies. Uh, he plays Vladimir here, and uh, I, I just like how he is kind of the main big bad of the prison before, you know, we encounter with T.J. Crowder and Boyka. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he... He's a cool guy. He's done all kinds of things, including motion capture for video games, like one of those Incredible Hulk games. So yeah, uh, but here it, he you actually feel, even though he doesn't have much dialogue, you feel like he has a big presence in the ring. Oh no, I think his his fight scene was great, honestly. Totally. And it's weird. It's like they call him Vladimir in the movie, and yet he's credited as Sakov. So I think that's his surname, according to Wikipedia whatever anyway yeah he's done plenty of other fights including in badass and with danny trejo and uh 
swelter with Van Dam. So yeah, um, guest start on Banshee uh, and Warrior. Yeah, I think honestly, in terms of the fights, I think number three has the best and has the best fights because uh, to me it 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 has it both. It has the quality and it has the quantity because and... there's tons of fight scenes and they're all beautifully done. And what I think is even more of a testament to the choreographer, Larnell Stovall, is each one has their own flavor. Not a single one feels like the other. Correct. And here you kind of feel like uh, everybody is just getting way more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just uh, instead of, you know, before it was, you know, static and then occasional tracking shots. Now it's gone beyond that. Now, Florentine and Stovall are now uh, just kind of shifting around and then setting up just like kind of just bigger mounted shots that show a bigger like third person perspective of this all. It's not even the audience necessarily. It's kind of the walls perspective. (laughs) Yeah. It's not restricted, like you say. Yeah. And overall, it's just. I think I think it's a very well put together film, and I think it could have done well in theaters had it had the chance to go that way. Uh, yeah, it, it played at Action Fest, but that was it. <laughs> yeah, it's a limited. Uh, yeah. Other than that, uh, part four. I mean, I feel like this has the best story. Part four. I, the I would parts. agree because we start to get to see a little bit of who Boyka is behind the fighter. It's not formulaic. You know that now it's becoming a totally different thing now. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of hinted at, I mean, I wouldn't say really hinted at, but it's kind of touched on throughout the series is that with him being this kind of fighter, he feels like he's doing the Lord's work. Correct. Yeah. Because, and he even states it like, he states it like that in number four, because he has that line. Um where the priest is like, you know, we appreciate your money, but like, do you think God approves of what you do? And he's like, well, I think God has given me this gift and it would be a sin to waste it. Right. And so, and, you know, Scott Atkins, I think, you know, he's the one who created the character. He brought him to life and he likes, I like how he explained the the character. He was like, well, we know based on his tattoos that he has connections to the Russian mafia. And w- I'm going to naturally assume that maybe the Russian mafia kind of is the reason why he's in prison. And totally. so maybe he kind of feels like they've betrayed him or they did him wrong in some sort of way. And he can tap into that rage that he feels when he's in the ring. And that's why he's such a good fighter, but he's able to maintain that control. Right. He- he's gotten this far to, to quit now would just be all for nothing. Yeah, but at the same time, like, but I still like that explanation. It's like, you know, God doesn't approve of your fighting. And I was like, okay, well, if he doesn't approve of me fighting, then why would he give me the ability to fight? Right. (laughs) And, I mean, what what else is there to say at that point? Right. It it would be redundant if it just went any other place. Yeah, I mean, because that, that pretty much says it best. And to me, I think that was... In the fourth one, I think that was a very, I think it was a smart move, you know, to say it like that and then just leave it at that. Concur. And then going further into the story where he has to fight to save his deceased opponent's wife from uh, slavery, as you want to call it. And I mean, it shows that, you know, he's not just fighting to be fighting. There's always a reason for him to fight. And I got to remember, was it someone he had fought earlier or from just off screen, like implied? No, no, no. He fought somebody in the movie and accidentally killed him. That's what it was. Right. And I don't honestly, I don't even think that the word like killed it would be appropriate because to me, when you kill somebody, there's that malicious intent behind it. Right. Accidental. So like if I, if I no disclaimer, I'm not a murderer, but 
Let's say, for instance, Cam, I kill you. If someone says Braden killed Cam, right, that means I came up to you with the malicious intent to do you physical harm. You've been thinking about this a while and finally unleashed it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what that means. But when you're fighting and it's a contact sport and someone dies, I don't find that as murder. It's a contact sport. There was no ill intent behind it. It was a sport. Correct. So, unless still the fighter guilty. chose from the get-go, hey, I, I'm taking this way too far. I'm going to go kill this guy. But again, that well, I mean, let's, it's like let's, let's bring let's the detectives take me, in for that. <laughs> let's, let's take me for instance. <laughs> I mean, you you you've been knowing me for a minute now, so you know that I I be doing tournaments as often as I can. Correct. I I go to tournaments as like it's a, like a fun sporting event. I view karate tournament me going to karate tournaments the same way as you know people put together like these neighborhood basketball leagues and they enter like citywide tournaments mm-hmm. and they play basketball. I view that the same way. Right. So if I was to go to a karate tournament and I'm I'm fighting somebody, we got all the gear and everything, but let's just say. I landed that perfect kick on his head and I got the knockout, but he goes to the hospital later and he passes away because I caused a, I ruptured something in his head. Correct. I would feel terrible. There was no malicious intent there to end his life. Right. And this movie does a good job of reinforcing, Hey, you know, this was not intended at all. Exactly. At first we wonder if, kind of like the first one uh, or the second one uh, was something tampered with behind the scenes the being set up again you know but i mean at the same time you know what it made me think at least was you know he's fighting each 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 movie he's fighting for a reason correct and and i think the fourth one kind of reinforces that notion if anything it kind of brings it to life because in the second one He's looked at as the villain. Well, okay, he had to get to the top so he could survive at prison. Yeah. Because he knows if he loses, then people are going to start dogging on him, and then life is going to get so much worse for him in prison. So he has to maintain that top spot so he can survive. The third movie, he has a chance to fight in this tournament and be released. So right. now he's fighting for his freedom. He's getting. He's gotten beyond the anti-hero or opposing force. Now he. Is. Yeah, I mean, I'm still not saying he's a good guy by any means, but you know, he's fighting so he can have. He's fighting for a reason. He's fighting so he can be released from prison. And then in the fourth one, he's escaped from prison and he's fighting in some underground leagues and he's wanting that big shot. And then when he accidentally, when that guy dies from fighting in the ring, now he's fighting to make amends with the guy's wife. Yeah. And I find that respectable because, you know, each movie he's fighting for a reason. He's not just fighting to be fighting. And he's also, I mean, at this point, that's all he can do. He just knows, hey, these mobsters who oversee this whole, you know, thing are going to target her next. But I also like the fact that they took it a little bit real world with it. Like you didn't just see him fight in the ring. There was a couple fight scenes that took place outside of the ring. Totally. It was it was dynamite. And and I think with Tim Mann coming in as the fight choreographer, that's one thing that I like about uh all three of the Undisputed with Boyka in them is they all three had a different choreographer, so they all three have a different flair. And they all stand out. They're all they're yeah. They're not trying to copy each other, they're not trying to seem isolated or just restricted. Just... But at the same time, the, they all stand out and and they all have their own different flavor, but they also have the same kind of feel. Totally. Because, you know, you got J.J. Perry who did uh, the second one, and then you had Larnell Stovall come in for the third one, and then Tim Mann takes over for the fourth one. Yeah. And so I feel like... So for, for all of those... For all of these movies to happen, and between when number two was released and when number four was released, that's like... 11 years. Totally. 
And so for all of them to have maintained the same kind of feel, and you can't look like you watch Undisputed Four and you're like, okay, this is these are some undisputed fights. And you do the same thing for number three and for number two. Because I know you've seen like a movie and then a sequel, like you've seen an action movie, and then you can definitely tell there was a change in the regime somewhere because something feels off. Yeah, and we, we've we grown up, most of us, at least. We know it's not just the director or the writer or even necessarily the studio. It's so much bigger. If they're, mm-hmm. if the rest of the crew, you know, it's, it's like anything. Uh, a political office, a business, a workplace, if so much of it has changed it's and it has an identity crisis, it's going to just feel out of place with what happened before. And here, like you say, everything just kind of flows the, in, in terms of the fight scenes. They all kind of have the same flavor, which I think is impressive considering you have three different individuals working on these films in terms of the fight choreography. A total rarity, too. They're not trying to outdo each other. They're trying to be their own special mm-hmm. oyster. They're just trying to earn their keep and serve the story and serve the gimmick. It's like, we're not here to dick around. And uh, Florentine, I know, did some on-credit reshoots, but I think had a schedule conflict or creative disagreement, one of the two, and maybe both. And Actually, actually, I heard a very different uh, theory, or not a theory, but... I heard from somebody who heard through the grapevine from somebody who actually worked on the movie (laughs) that uh, Isaac Florentine actually directed the whole movie. But because he directed the movie, but he was gone for like, I think his wife passed away and so he was constantly back and forth between well he he would he would shoot and then he would have to go do some stuff regarding his wife's death like funeral arrangements stuff like that mm-hmm. and he himself did not feel like he deserved the director credit because he wasn't able to put his all in it that's why the other guys credited oh wow I thought it was a director skill dispute or some bullshit. <laughs> that's that's not what I heard. Like I said, I I have no confirmed sources. This is just what I've heard. Either way, I that's a shame that he had to deal with that. You know, it's just yeah. Crazy. Whether whether it was some creative decisions or a death in the family, because the uh, there is an in memory to his wife at the end of the movie. Gotcha. Okay. I think I did see that. I just didn't know what it represented or meant. <laughs> yeah. Because the the movie is shot in standard Florentine style. So it was like either this dude studied directly under Isaac and learned all his tips and tricks and is basically doing the exact same thing he would or Isaac's the real mastermind behind this movie. Yeah, one of the two. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Isaac is listed as a a producer and executive producer on the movie. At least he got some kind of credit. I mean, yes. Like if his name was nowhere on there, then I would be like, okay. But where he is listed there in other capacities, that's why I kind of, I kind of believe that the story that I heard. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and. Unfortunately, there's always going to be just some kind of credit dispute. I'm just going to say, okay, well, they worked on it. They worked on it. They deserve credit. (laughs) I'm more likely to believe, again, uh, IMDb, regardless of what, uh, on credit or not, they probably do deserve uh, to have three directors listed, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I saw somewhere where he was listed as an uncredited director. I don't remember if that was IMDb or... Uh, yeah, he he's definitely listed as uncredited on here in, in some occasions. I think they took it down and then they put it back up. So shit, that's weird. Either way, well, good good digging sport. <laughs> um, but I said I'm just I'm just a nerd when it comes to all this. So any like behind the scenes tidbits and stuff that I find out, I'm like, ooh, that's juicy. I'm keeping that. <laughs> right. 
Oh man. So yeah, these uh if you were to do a fifth one, um, uh, how do you think it would look? Like me personally, if I was in charge of the fifth one? Yeah, I just or at least come up with a story idea. <laughs> if I was in charge of the fifth one, well you, you gotta understand that the fourth one ended with Boyka back in prison. Correct. So I would turn the fifth one and it's gonna get kind of controversial, but what I would do is I would start it off like a normal like a normal undisputed movie, have some of your uh have some of your, you know, ring fights and all that kind of stuff. But then I would turn it into where Boyka is kind of, he got a taste of the outside. He, he yearns for it now. So now it's going to turn into like a prison break movie where he's fighting guards and everything to try and get through. And call me crazy, but I would kill Boyka at the end. <laughs> Till the next sequel, he could always fake his death. Well, see, because to me, like I feel like five is where it should end. Any anything more, I feel like you're being a little bit re- too too redundant. But that's that's what I would do. Is I would, I I would make it a prison break movie and have him like almost get there, and then he dies. He is killed. Okay. Oh. <laughs> As long as it's just very well set up, I mean, even then he could be maybe. I I would go with just injured, not able to fight anymore. But whatever, you know, whatever is cinematic. Well, see, because if you kill him, then you know, you would have to do some really hard digging to find out why. It, like you would have to do some really hard digging to figure out how to do a sixth one, which to me is like, you know. If, you kill him that's kind of it you know what i'm saying no i get it i just <laughs> so that's that's why i would do it that way either way um uh have they still been talking about doing an eighth or, or fifth or sixth one um i've heard uh scott atkins did an interview and he said that there is um a treatment out there for an undisputed five and he likes the idea and from what i've heard from an inside source i mean again if scott likes the idea then that's really all that matters but me personally i was not a fan of it because it from what i heard it sounds like it would try to do too much hmm. too ambitious yeah so, I mean, it's not that it's necessarily a bad idea. It's just, I feel like you would be too busy. A lot of convincing needed. To just yeah. Right. No. I'm pretty open. I just don't. I just don't want it to just be half-assed where it just feels like they're just trying to crank it out and somewhere along the way uh, forgot the main soul of them. And to uh, me, that's kind of why I don't like the the idea of the fifth one because it feels like it would be a whole lot of fan service and kind of forgetting about the story. Right. So now we know. By the way, it's been fun discussing all these choreography. Uh, feel free to promote your current project. Well, we just wrapped principal photography on my feature film, Double Cross, produced by my production banner, TKO Productions, we just wrapped uh, principal photography like, like three-ish weeks ago as of this recording. And we still have some pickups to do in April, but as I told you off screen, that, uh, uh, you know, we still have some little bitty scenes to shoot because there's always been some somebody who's not available for every block but it's literally we just have to go in and okay let's do this scene real quick let's do this scene real quick let's do this scene real quick and we can make it up and then we'll have that i'm hoping that'll be out by uh hopefully 
I'm hoping that'll be out within a year. I mean, it's still um, in the process of being edited. I still got to go through uh, clearances and copyright and all that kind of stuff before I can actually release it. Because you know, doing my short was one thing because it was a it was something fun for my YouTube channel at first. But where this mm-hmm. is something a little bit bigger, there's a there's more steps to it. So I got to go through the copyright uh deal make sure everything clears that and uh but yeah this uh, what, one, what's it about and called for those who uh know. uh film double cross it is about two brothers that are trained mercenary assassin type who uh have a difference of opinion when it comes to their new employer only to discover later on down the road that this employer is also related to their past. Mm. And so, but the, the, I think the interesting dynamic there is less about the connection to the past and more about the dynamic of the brothers, because the one brother is thinking one way and another brother is thinking another way. And the two, kind of come to blows that we actually do have a fight scene between the two brothers played by myself and third degree black belt taekwondo instructor blake longshore we have a a little fight scene between ourselves because really it's just really all they know because you know one person's fighting one argument and one person's fighting another so you know they both come to the conclusion all right well you're not listening to me we have to fight this out even right. though they're fighting two different battles, but that's, you know, the the movies. I feel like you know I've been watching the behind the scenes stuff, and you know, um, I've been I've been seeing how everything looks. My director slash editor, David Heath Ferguson, he's been sending me some clips that he's edited. He's sending me some raw clips before they're edited. I think the movie's going to be amazing. Um, will it have its flaws? Of course, every movie does. But I do think this movie will solidly represent what I'm trying to... I think it'll do what I'm trying to do for myself in the world of indie action movies. I want to show people that I am a true competitor in this space, and I think this film will help me do that. And then after Double Cross, um, I just announced on social media my next film is going to be called Dark Deal, which is... um, it has a lot of similarities to other to 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 a couple other movies. Um, it can be compared to Seized from Scott Adkins, uh, Running Red with Jess Speakman. A lot of similarities with those two, um, but it's my own take on it. Uh, you know, you got uh, a special operations guy who takes down a criminal. The criminal ends up getting he. Uh, so the special operations officer, he takes down this criminal mastermind. He goes to court. There's not enough physical evidence for a conviction. It's one of those, everyone in their mama knows this dude did it, but there's not enough physical evidence to He prove covered it. his tracks too well. Yeah, I mean, but it's one of those things. It's common knowledge that he's doing these things. You know what I mean? Right. It's not really he's covering his tracks. It's just he's not leaving the physical evidence. Everyone knows he's doing it. Because if he was covering his tracks, and it would be a shock. Like, what? He's doing this stuff? No, everyone knows. He's just not leaving the evidence behind. And so he walks away. Therefore, my character goes into witness protection out of fear of retaliation. And, you know, three years go by. He's all but forgotten his life as a spec ops officer. He's got a fiance who has an eight-year-old daughter. You know, he's... He's a he's a manager at a at a diner, and you know he's doing a nine to five in between all this. Yeah, aspects. he's he's completely, you know, these past three years he's just, you know, not even thought about the spec ops life, and then something happens at his restaurant that blows his cover, and then a uh, criminal mastermind guy finds him and says, you know, I. I want you to work for me. And he's like, you got to be fucking idiot. Ain't no way I'm going to work for you. And he's like, all right, well, that's fine. We'll just kill your family. (laughs) 
And so he has to make that dark deal and say, all right, I'll work with you, but you leave my family out of this. Typically how it goes <laughs> in between planning to take down the villain. <laughs> and so that also, you know, it puts a lot of stress on him. And with it putting stress on him, it puts stress on his family because the family is not aware of this danger. They just know over the last few days he's been acting strange and he, they want to know why. Correct. But he's like, I don't want to tell you because... Because, like I said, he's he's living a completely new life now. He has a new name. He, he has a new last name and all that. So he's, you know, he's a totally different person. Witness protection set him up with a new birth certificate, social security card, all that stuff. So he's literally a completely new person. So, you know, he's literally being somebody that he's not. Right. And so it causes a lot of stress on his family because he's like, I want to tell you, but I can't. Because that puts you in harm's way. And then finally, when he realizes there's no way of avoiding the danger, he goes ahead and tells them and, you know, the story sorts itself out. But that's going to be my next project. Uh, Dark Deal, we're hoping to shoot next summer. And uh, beyond that, of course, you know, I've said this every Every time I've come on, come on here, we do plan on making a feature-length version of Skin Circuit. We just got to find the right time to do it. It's, it. It is a project that we are actively working on. It's just, you know, we're trying to find the right time to do it because we, we're trying to, because this is going to be, you know, we're trying to, everyone's trying to develop their skills. So I, I already know some people I'm going to bring on board. And I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page, which is why we're doing a couple of movies beforehand, because a couple of these people I'm bringing from Double Cross to Dark Deal to Skin Circuit. So I want to make sure that we have, you know, that we're all on the same page. That way we can all deliver the best product that we can when it comes to making the feature length version of Skin Circuit. And then beyond that, who knows? It just depends on how many ideas hit me in the middle of the night. (laughs) <laughs> but that's that's what i'm working on right now um i should be testing for my third degree black belt uh next summer as well at some point so that's the work working that. on that um was was originally supposed to test for it uh around this time but uh financial issues i haven't been able to go to karate class as much because my karate class is about an hour and a half away from where i live so that got pushed back to this coming up summer but hopefully I can I can get it done and that'll be that. Okay. But that's really nice. that's all I got going on, you know, other than being a husband and a dad now. But you know. <laughs> hey, get it. <laughs> but that's all the interesting stuff I have going on. I mean, like I said, my, my nine to five keeps me pretty busy. Um like I said, I'm a husband and a dad now, so there's that. So I'm 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 just all over the place, you know. <laughs> As long as keep your eyes on the prize. <laughs> but yeah, man, that's that's really all that's going on in the life of Braden Deep White at the moment. Okay, very neat. And keep trucking. Keep pushing. I'm gonna keep going until either I die or my body just physically won't let me no more. Okay, even better. <laughs> Great having you on here. You too, man. Appreciate it. We'll return after these messages. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as... Captain America versus Darth Vader, Solid Snake versus the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop versus Terminator, and even the Muppets versus Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR, we add them to our queues, we wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters Podcast, 
sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S. We are in the U.K. We are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan. We're in Australia, y'all. BlindKnowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.